I don't know if that's going to show up in the audio or not. I was waiting for it to stop before I started recording, but my neighbor just got a riding lawnmower and it's been raining all day long. <laughs> He's doing donuts in the back of his yard, which is hilarious. And uh, the grass is dead enough and had grown long enough earlier that He's, I don't think he's doing any... It's not my yard, so I don't really care. I just find it funny. Um, I think he's just excited to finally have a riding lawnmower. But on the same subject of, you know, being out in this weather, I went for a long walk today. Fairly long walk, probably about 15, 15 minutes or so. And I walked around a wooded lake area. It was a lot of fun. It, it got some thoughts out of my head. There are times when... And I think I've spoken to this before when we we can sometimes get locked down into where we are and we feel either trapped or stuck or something. And as much as I can be crabby about wanting to either do something physical to change my mental demeanor or not, I have to admit it does work more often than not. It doesn't solve the problem, but it at least starts getting the creative juices flowing. And I also got a chance, I'll catch you guys up for this part. So there's an, a cat who was left behind by his owners and I've taken to feeding him and there's a house, there's two houses out there now for him to choose from. I don't think he'd ever known what it was like to be inside for very long. So he just, he looks at the houses. I think he might get in them. I don't know, but he's got a whole bunch of pine and straw and other stuff like that he can lay in and a big bush that protects him during the winter and the rainy season and he grew his undercoat really thick and he's just such a wonderful little guy uh, his name is Munchie and uh, his full name is Munchie Manfred the third and I make stupid names for my cats but you know what I love that <laughs> man I'm uh, just sitting down right now getting ready to start drawing on my book again I laid out a few of my comic pages. That was exciting. I got It got me thinking about some plot areas when I was walking that I was like, oh wait, maybe this could work or this. Then I came across two really good ideas that I was very excited about. So I'm looking forward to expanding those and working them into the current comic scripts that I have. I don't really know sometimes, I get these ideas and at least the good thing is I've started really relying on my notes app and stuff like that in my phone and I've started putting those things down for later use because I never quite know when that's going to come around. It Because I know that like in past years, I have often not written something down saying, oh, it's going to stay with me, it's going to stay with me, it's going to stay with me. I forgot what it was. And I hate that. It'll be something that'll be so wonderful. Or at least I think in my mind it's wonderful at that moment. It may have been just a terrible idea that flushed its way out. But I wanted to show you guys something. This just came in the mail today. Uh, I actually got a couple of packages but this one is really cool so this is oh, i already bent it um this is character design quarterly and i've spoken to people about this before a buddy of mine when i used to work at hallmark he uh he turned me on to this he got in on the kickstarter and um this is such a wonderful magazine it covers a lot of things about character design it tells you the story behind the creators and the illustrators behind this stuff i mean a lot of stuff that I find pretty invaluable. I know that the magazine has its critics. People will kind of shout, you know, shout about it and say, oh, well, you can learn this from anyone or whatever. But sometimes it's just nice to get something in hand that you can look at and enjoy the visuals in and then read about the artists and the stories behind them and what they're doing and who these people are. And it breaks down all sorts of things like working with form factors and color, how you build character sheets, all this stuff. It is through 3D Total Publishing, and each issue is 16 bucks if you buy it off their website. I think they still have some of the back issues. I, I'm only missing one or two in my collection of these, and I don't get around to, wear, to wearing, to reading these as much as I should, but they are a blast to read. The other thing I got talking about art and that sort of stuff was I ordered um, a little while ago from this company called Toy Du Jour, and they were carrying, the name is escaping me, but these cool figures, they're like, they're kind of five point of articulation, but they got to come with a lot of stuff on them. And I got this little guy. 
the lighting is terrible, but yeah, maybe I'll do a quick uh, B-roll shot over this. I think, in fact, that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, um, this guy is rad. He comes with like all kinds of accessories, extra heads, all this other stuff. And the reason I got that was because it's an indie artist that does that stuff. And I'm really huge into that sort of thing. I keep thinking about the stuff coming up this next year. I'm already seeing shows. Every single time I start seeing, you know, stuff like these magazines coming out and stuff, I start to think about my own work and where I'm headed with it. And one of the one of the goals that I don't understand is where exactly am I landing with this sort of stuff? Because I'm reminded how many business expenses are just waiting to be spent, <laughs> waiting to come into the fold for me. And I got to thinking, I really genuinely don't believe that I'm going to be doing that many shows this year. And I'm making the choice on that. It's, you know, at the same time, that almost sounds a little career suicidal because I do manage to get some footing and I do manage to talk to people and sell when it's in person. I don't really sell much of anything on my Etsy store. I've had a couple of rushes. I think total I've got 14 sales on there. And thankfully they've all been pretty good size sales. And I am extremely grateful for the ones that I did get. But the marketing that I've had to do is so limited. And so this is, I guess, something I can talk to right now about this really quickly, which is on my mind. When I was walking around, I kept thinking about that. What is the end game for me on this? You know, social media by its very nature is all about, it, it's built upon now an infrastructure of, it used to be hashtags and, and how many times you posted, but now it really depends on how many people are interfacing with your posts, whether they like them, whether they share them, whatever. And that can be a nightmare for me. I do try to create content now daily and I'm still doing it for a lot of my other accounts at the same time that I am trying to find energy and time to focus on everyday life aspects and my artwork. I have a countdown timer that tells me how many days I have left to get this comic book, this first graphic novel completed into the printer. I think I am down to 73 days, which is terrifying. Now there's still some built in time in there, of course, to get it to the printer so it can ship back to me and I'll have it ready for the first shows that I'll be doing. But even then I thought to myself, I put a lot of duress upon myself. Like I don't really like where I'm heading with this. I'm scared I'm gonna stumble and fall and fail again. But I also know that there are people that will message me every once in a while and talk to me and go, hey, can't wait till volume one comes out. Hey, really looking forward to seeing where the story goes. And I don't wanna let those people down either. I don't wanna let myself down, which is really what's most important. And that sounds selfish, right? But the truth is, is that I can't be my best self if I don't work on myself, if I don't accomplish the, the things that I need and then can be a better friend, just better, better person overall, better artist. And that is something I continually have to struggle with because I don't have those answers. And I know eventually I'll find them, they'll come along but it's still hell waiting for it, right? At least, I don't know, maybe maybe I'm overthinking it. Maybe there's something more there that I'm not really latching on to. I don't know, I don't know. But I find myself more and more feeling withdrawn. And last year was so much people interaction that it was even hard getting the blog posts done that I have done about last year's shows. It's been crazy. There was even a um, an art grant that I was putting in for. I still got to come up with a budget for it. But in that art grant, it was, you know, I always get a little bit frustrated with those because as nice as they are, they almost seem to be fostered toward some grand evocative project. Like, well, I'm going to do this thing that involves members of the community and I'm going to overwork myself to death for an amount of money that really, in all honesty, I just need to pay the bills so that I can function enough to get the rest of the stuff done that I hope will launch me into a career long after this grant amount has dissipated. But I understand that whenever people do grants, 
They want to know what is, who is the most deserving? Who is doing the highest, most acclaimed thing? And it comes down to PR. It comes down to what's going to make them look good. What makes, what looks good? What looks sexy in a, in a newsletter, right? Not some jackass sitting in a studio full of fucking toys. <laughs> they don't really give a fuck about that. They want to know if I'm going to change the world. They want to know how I'm going to help the community. And I hope they don't watch this fucking video. But the truth is, I don't think I'll get things like that. Not because I'm not a professional. Not because I don't get the shit done. I do. And I've worked on community projects. I've done stuff like that before. All the way back to when I was an Eagle Scout. But I think the difference is that there seems to be almost a disconnect in there. Where you're, you know, at least for me, it's 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 very much where I can understand that an art collective or... An investor or something wants to see some sort of return. And that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to pay back the loan. It does mean they want something for themselves. It's stroking the ego. It's whatever. It's one of the reasons I have a huge fucking problem with the Parade of Hearts art movement here in town. Yeah, there's some decent people involved with it. The whole thing doesn't make any fucking sense. And there was so many things that went wrong at the gala event they had whenever they were auctioning off the ones they thought were the favorites. There's just a lot of weird, weird corporate overreach in that bullshit that it just really made me sick. I am happy for everyone that was involved with it, but it always seems that creatives in general, and this is going to get real crazy, real heavy, real fast, but I promise not to make this real long. It always feels like anyone that does anything creative, we're useful until we're not. And that's been the recent upheaval that's happened, even with the AI stuff I've spoken about, not even ad nauseum, but quite frequently on here. And the vile rhetorics and bashing that happened online back and forth about this, the misunderstandings and the minutia that is argued back and forth over that, when at its base reality, it is one more factor that says, I don't want to pay artists. I don't have the budget for it, or I don't understand the artists. I've known very few places that will hire you on as a creative and will let you do your thing. I understand the need for art directors. I understand the need for critiques and revisions and concepts being approved. Completely understand that. What I don't understand is how whether we're talking about grants or we're talking about public events that are supposedly built upon movements of art or anything like freelancing or the whole AI art movement, it always comes down to, quite frankly, we love the arts, but we're not that fond of the artists. Or we are fond of the artists so long as they entertain us, they're friendly, they're kind, they're just like having a semi-feral pet jaguar. And that's a terrible, really, this is a terrible analogy because I know that the wrong person could take this out of context and say, well, Mario is clearly saying all artists are animals. No, I'm saying that there is fundamentally a very locked down mechanism that exists within either corporate America or the people that write grants or just in general, the expectations of what an artist is. And if you don't believe me, watch any major media movie that's ever been made. They skip over a lot and they focus in on a few. You hear, you always see things about Van Gogh or Picasso or something like that, but there is a wide spectrum of artists that lean in from ultra conservative to or wow, super liberal, and everything in between. I've met that a lot of people in that spectrum. And the one unifying factor in there is the art of creation. Or destruction, depending on what your medium is and what your attitude about the stuff is. But the point is, a far larger contingent of people don't really understand the underpinnings of what it means to give yourself over to art and to function within that space. There is a romanticism, an idealistic 
bullshit maneuver that is commonplace in your average person that thinks, well, it's good for them to suffer. Motherfucker, no, it's not. <laughs> it is not. I'm here to tell you it is. It's not. It's really not. And it, it's not even because the, the horrible part is that even transpires over into small business owners, people that may themselves not be creatives, but they're just trying to run like a restaurant or something like that. It, it can affect them. It can really wear them down because there's this idea, well, if it's too hard, then why are you doing it? Just go get a job like everybody else. That's the, that same sort of addle headed mentality has been layered upon people working in the service industry for years. And that's toxic and stupid because if we didn't have people working in those jobs, who the fuck is going to make you your, uh, your sandwich there, Karen? How's that going to work? And so there's always this oversimplicity that I get really, if not aggravated, certainly down about. The reason I brought all that up was because I really wanted to look at how last year went. And I know that every single year, every single encounter, every single show has some chance of being completely different than the first experience. There will be different people, there'll be different weather, there'll be different times, yada, yada, yada. A host of variables that I could not hope to be able to control, much less predict. And I'm, I understand that. But there is this factor where I have to look at it and at least take a best guess scenario and go, is it worth my time to go back out there to do these shows, to, to throw myself back out in, into this wide open ocean and attempt to swim when I had so many near misses last year? And the safety guy in me is like, no, nah, let's, uh, let's stop right there and not do anything. And then just try and figure out the other aspects of my business and do things here and locally. But then there's always that fear missing out aspect. There's always this whole thing of what, well, okay, fine, but one more year, right? And in the grand scheme of things, the other part of my head starts going, well, but if I don't do all the things now, then that's one more year that's gone by where I didn't push myself as hard as I did the previous year. Well, the only reason I'm really doing that is because of dire straits financially. You push that much into doing shows and there's no return on the investment. You, you have to stop. Eventually, the car runs out of gas. And that's exactly where I am. Not just that I ran out of stuff in some ways, but also mentally, emotionally, and quite frankly, physically. I just I don't think I could wander into any one of the larger halls and do that. And I, it, there's a weird, I've always felt there was a large disconnect, a massive disconnect with the larger shows and your average creator. They know that those are people that pay, you know, depending on the show, and I'm, I'm specifically focusing on larger shows, 200 up to $500 a table in Artist Alley, depending on if you're a creator, depending on if you're a comic creator. So are not just, not just a creator, like not a vendor, but like a maker. I've seen that sort of stuff happen. I think that's fucking unfair as hell, but whatever. And and then the vendors. Jesus, man, if you're like a comic vendor, you might be paying $1,000 for a 10 by 10 foot square booth with some tables. And the, when you say it out loud, at least for me, I guess unless I'm running this show, that sounds insane. That sounds absolutely bullshit insane to me. And I think even when I see the forums, there have been many shows that I've looked at where I'm like, no, there's no way. Because, you know, they're just looking at the table costs, which is bad enough. But when you start figuring everything else you have to do to get ready for that, it never pans out. It just doesn't. You have to be ridiculously well-known, in demand, or just the hottest shit in the room. But the truth is, there's a lot of that whole fear of missing out. It took me a few years to get over that. Because just going to a show and seeing all these people doesn't mean I'm doing good. And other people don't understand that. It's no different than when you say, well, I've got this, I got a small gallery showing. Oh, really? Where is it? Well, you know, it's at a coffee house. Or maybe you're actually in an art gallery somewhere. But if nobody comes to your opening, if that gallery doesn't have a lot of attendees, you're kind of hosed. You're not going to gain any footing from that. And you won't have any sales. 
It all depends. Honestly, that's one of the reasons why I do love much smaller shows or medium-sized shows, because at least you have a chance. It's more laid back, and in almost every single circumstance I can think of, the person running the show has made the effort to go around the show and talk to everybody, see how they're doing. Many times, I've gotten food, I've gotten other amenities that have worked out wonderfully. And maybe I didn't have a good show at that smaller show, but goddamn, it goes a long way to making you feel better if somebody gives a hell about what you're putting out there. I'm not asking them to buy my books. I'm not asking them to buy my artwork. All I asked for was just a little bit of comprehension that we're there. And the argument can be made, well, when you get these, doing these bigger shows, you know, it's all about, you know, the bigger people, the media stars, whatever. That's fine. C2E2 was probably my big bow out. I really thought that was going to be much different, and it <laughs> really wasn't. I know that at least now I've got some different ideas as to what I want to do. But there are times whenever I don't really know what to tell artists that are coming into it that'll ask me questions about the shows. I have started getting some responses and some thoughts on the past entries I did on, on my website about the different shows I did and the costs inherent and things and even some of the crazy shit I went through. It's ranged from people saying, God damn, I don't want to do shows now, which is, was never my intent. I'm like, no, be an artist. Do what you have to do. There's plenty of people. I have a multitude of acquaintances and friends that go and do shows, and they do fucking gangbusters. Okay? But just understand that a lot of times when you do these shows, there's expectations and things that lure people in. So there's a reason why you see the wall of print motherfuckers that are like, break the rules all the time. Like, nothing, no booth should be over eight foot tall. All of a sudden, some dumbass has a 40-foot-tall fucking wall of bullshit out there, and it's all fan art. Don't get me wrong, I like fan art, too. But if you're really doing a good spin on it, and you're really also working on other stuff, great. And I know that there's people out there that do great stuff like that, but I will see stuff that is exactly a carbon copy of Family Guy or something, and I don't understand that. Or you'll just see a lot of headshots and things that I'm like, well, there's nothing interesting happening with this. So what are you doing? And that's, I think that's just from years of seeing like that sort of thing happen. So I'm going to end this by telling you guys about a story. One of the weirdest things, I will not name the show. I still have photos of the booth and everything, but this is a real honest to God fucked up circumstance. And I want to preface this by saying I am not necessarily attacking the people, just what they did. Okay, you ready? All right. So, I do this show, and I'm in a really weird row where I really don't know anyone. I do remember that Frank Cho was down the way from me. And I think he was literally two or three tables away from me. And I used to like his stuff a lot. I, I really don't follow Liberty Meadows anymore or anything else like that. Still a phenomenal artist, all that other stuff. I just, my own preferences changed. But aside from him, I didn't know anybody else in the row. And so when I was setting up, I'm usually, I am one of those people that I want to break the ice quickly, but I also understand and respect people's spaces. So I'll be kind of quiet at first. And then if I have an opportunity or a chance to talk to somebody, I will. Then there are some circumstances, sometimes when I just, I'm really quiet or I'm not in the zone. I'm like, I don't want to be rude to anybody. But in this circumstance, there was, there was two adults <laughs> and a child that were in the booth next to mine. And the only somewhat enjoyable aspect about having had them as my neighbors were that, that the child was actually really cool. And only one of the parents, the mother, stayed there during the show. To my left, there was a very young girl that I have not seen in any more shows, but I don't even wander the Artist Alley areas too much anymore at this particular show when I do go to it. It was her first show. And she was there with her father and her brother, and she had a smattering of little sketches out and some other things. I felt really bad because her father 
was super nervous. She was trying to enjoy the show and I think she was doing the best she could, but her father was just like pacing and okay, uh, is this gonna work? God, we look so unprofessional and everything. So I spent a little bit of time talking to him and saying, hey, you know, things are looking great, man. Nice setup. He's like, you think so? Do you, do you really think so? Like, yeah, man. I mean, like, that's better than what I went through when I first started doing these shows. I was like, my very first show was horrible. Like, I, nobody could tell who I was. I just looked like a random homeless dude that wandered in and sat down at a table and had some drawings and shit in front. And over time, <laughs> over time, he seemed to, that seemed to quell it a little bit for him. And the next thing I knew was that, you know, the show was getting ready to start. Well, the people next to me had a bunch of stuff. Now, this is in Artist Alley, right? So it's supposed to be have a creator's book, you know, that sort of thing. At least or some drawings that are your own something. You're an artist, right? Preferably that you have a fucking book, I would surmise. Well, they didn't have that. What they did have was a bunch of other stuff. And this was so weird to me. Like, so weird. I noticed that the first day they were there, they, you know, you kind of get used to what people wear at conventions, right? Which is a lot of shirts with like logos and like Deadpool or some shit, or they're in cosplay, or they just, there's, it's, it's bad to say this, but a certain look that can happen for Comic Con attendees. And I, you know what the fuck I'm talking about. And, and I don't mean that in a negative way. I just want to, fuck, I'm covering my ass big time here. <laughs> but I'm being serious. I think you guys get what I'm saying. I looked at them, I was like, these motherfuckers have never done a comic convention in their lives. And I and I don't even mean to be mean. I don't mean it like the like the family. That this was clearly their first, but you could tell that the son and the daughter, the dad was nervous as hell, and he had like a Transformer shirt on, which I was like, that's cool. And he as we got to talking, he did love Transformers and he felt like super relieved. I'm like, no, dude, there is a ton of dudes our age here that love that G1 shit. 1980s all the way. Like you will find walk around, you will find tables of this shit and people selling it. So he seemed really cool about that then. He that calmed him down a lot. Um, and then his daughter and his son were like, like his son was super into like, I think either Yu-Gi-Go or Pokemon. I don't remember which one. And his daughter was drawing My Little Pony and Elvira and all kinds of stuff. Like just a wonderful spectrum of inspiration in her fan art. And I was like, that's fucking rad. Now back over here to this side over here, this was fucked up. And it's probably gonna be reversed because of the way the camera's filming this, but you'll get the story anyway. I noticed that they had prints and this is one of the first times I ever saw this happening. I was like, I don't see a commonality across the prints. So I thought, okay, maybe maybe the mom and dad are artists. Because the art was clearly a caliber higher than what I would have expected this child that they had to be able to do. And I noticed, though, that as I walked by their tables a couple times, and during setup especially, they had some stuff there. And I looked at it, and I was like, is this a consortium of, like, artists? I, I just, something seemed off. But I ignored it, and Friday was hellaciously slow. So it was enough time to like talk to them and kind of on this side and kind of work with dad's anxiety. And they didn't really talk to me very much. I, I mentioned a couple things, but then at some point, the mother came over and took a look at everything. And I, I hate this question with all my existence. Kind of looked around. Did you do all this? And I always come back with some stupid ass thing. I was like, no, um, this is Jim Lee's booth. He's tied up in the bathroom. And she didn't get the joke. Normally, it's a terrible joke. But normally people go, oh, <laughs> you know, or something like that. And <laughs> nothing. Nothing. And she's like, oh, well, so does he do all this? I'm like, man, it's my, it's my work. This is all my work. Really? So the comic too, I'm like, and I had only Pagan Zoetrope at that time. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, well, we're, wow, I would pick it up, but we, you know, we're 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 a pretty Christian family. Which again, I don't care if you are or not, but I was like, that's a weird flex. But you know, th that whole Pagan Zoetrope name, that non sequitur name, was a mistake from the beginning, and I understand that now, but it's not fucking changing anymore. So I said, well, it's a non sequitur. It doesn't. It's it. It was just something I picked up. It's sort of an homage to how anime and man manga are sometimes named. And she's like, oh, okay. And nothing I was saying was connecting. Not one fucking thing. And it was like, I hate stilted conversations like that because I have genuinely, and this is before I really started learning a lot of different languages and stuff. 
I've had conversations with people from that spoke Portuguese or spoke French or even German. And it was before, you know, I could really understand because I can understand a lot of them now. And that was something I always hated was when I didn't understand what somebody was saying, I wanted to have some base understanding of what they were thinking. Now I'm talking about linguistic level bullshit. This is one, clearly she's talking to me in English. Clearly I am reciprocating by speaking in English and yet nothing's happening. And I'm like, fuck, because I love when I can talk to anybody and the, somebody will be like, hey, you like Transformers? I like GoBots. Hey, you like dinosaurs? I like Kaiju. And I'm like, what is happening here? That's the kind of shit I need because I'm a fucking human being. <laughs> I, I like that. That was not the case here. So she's completely flabbergasted and she's like, well, so like, She's asking weird questions, not specifically about my art, not about the Pagan Zoetrope book anymore. She definitely ignored that. Started asking some other questions like, so did you pay extra for them to install this booth for you? I'm like, no. These are my walls. I, I bought these. These are called pro panels. They're used on outdoor fairs and stuff. Oh, wow. And I don't care. I'll tell people how much they cost. It's not a bragging point. I, sometimes I think I'm nuts that I paid as much as I did. And she's like, so how much does a setup like that run? I was like, well, for these three walls and this banner, it's about $400 shipped. And I, it's two different companies. The banner, the pop-up banner is different and everything. Like her eyes get real big. And she's like, oh, so she wants my business card suddenly. And that's always a weird thing for me because the moment I say that I've spent a lot of money on either my setup or my printing or the prints or something or that I do something in-house... All of a sudden, somebody wants my information. It's not like, wow, this is the most fascinating and well-read book I've ever read. You know, like, they don't fucking care. It's something weird. And I got that whole, I'm going to end up in a tub missing my kidneys covered in ice vibe from them. And I don't even know why. I, that's what immediately where my mind goes to. I don't know if it was just because I watched CSI Miami too fucking much back in the day or what the shit. Nobody hate Horatio Kane is the shit. And the whole thing was that when that happened, I thought, oh, uh, okay, I have a weird feeling you don't make that art that's on your table. So I said, well, so, yeah, you know, you got questions. I got some questions. So, like, what's the, what's the style you work in? And there is something about a person's overall physical composition when you see them suddenly shift gears. And it's almost like, it's almost like when you're fucking with a manual transmission and you're like, gah, 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 and you grind that shit in. There was a way she almost stood and it was like, are you popping locking? What the fuck are you doing? And she just, she almost stopped. It was almost like she had to take out this fucking cassette and jam another one in there. That was like, you know, um, phrase one. Oh, I like to do different kinds of art. Like it was almost like premeditated thinking where it was rehearsed. It was really fucking weird. And I was like, huh. But she goes on to say, oh, well, yeah, we like to experiment with a lot of different kinds of art and things like that. And she's like, do you like any of them? They're for sale. Like she didn't go into any other detail, just they're for sale. So she grabs a couple and she was like, well, this is kind of like your artwork. And this is kind of like your artwork. And everything about that whole interaction started to really creep me the fuck out. And um, I remember thinking the whole time, you know, this is really weird. But I didn't think too much more beyond that. And then I think somebody came by our table and she kept giving the same sales pitch. And I, well, I am not a fan of recycled sales pitches. Every single person I talk to, they're going to get something of the same. Like the details, some stuff will maybe be the same. But when you say it verbatim again and again... And again, it is just like that scene in office space when the lady's in the background and she, I think is what, what she has that little boop, 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 voice in the background, like corporate account speaking, can you hold please? Or whatever the fuck she said. And it felt like that. And there was a recent person, that's a whole other story, that I was at another convention and they did this annoying fucking thing with fans. So they wanted to always show the fan out, but they would pop the fan and it, everyone's like, you know, they're, they're doing shit. They're like, because it was fucking annoying. I had a migraine that whole weekend and I stopped talking to them. This is all going to make me sound like I'm a super asshole to sit next to, but I swear to God, I'm not. 
<laughs> so anyway, this is where it got really weird. So she was kind of weird and dismissive about the art style and stuff and kept asking. She was like, well, you know, so what do you think this is? And I looked at it and I wanted to say, well, it looks like shit, but I didn't say that. I said, I, it kind of looks like, and I was making shit up. I was like, it kind of looks like gouache when it clearly looked like digital work. She's like, that's exactly what it is. And she's like, can you tell me what brand it is? I was like, no, I, I no, I don't know the brand. I, I just, you know, and it was weird. The more it went, and then like, I got a commission probably. So the, we stopped talking after somebody came to our table and then somebody came by and commissioned uh, an illustration of, of, of The Flash from DC. And they paid up front for it. And I remember she was like, she like I could see that she was like kind of like Ooh, what the hell's happening, and so I took the commission. I think I charged sixty five. It was a huge one. They wanted it in color and um, had my markers and everything with me when I back when I still did commissions. I quickly was blue penciling it up and everything else like that. And she came over and she was like, "I just I just love to see an artist work." That tipped me off to him like, okay. Not that I don't like watching other artists work. I do. That's why I fucking watch Twitch all the time. And I watch YouTube videos about this stuff. And she's like, so do you do that with every drawing? Now, mind you, a lot of the artwork on there were things like the Joker, Batman, a lot of DC characters, Link from The Legend of Zelda, stuff like that. And um, it was weird. They, they were doing all these things they just kept sending these signals to me like something was off so as, as she's going along she's like that's really good and so that where she was sitting she could see me drawing because I had a little prop up where I could draw the uh, the character of Flash or anything I was sketching and she just kept asking so how did how did you know that that's what that character looked like and I was like I don't know I used to read DC when I was a kid and I don't like looking at reference that's just me I just unless I don't know the character then I don't look at it. I don't want to rip off any other artists. I don't want to do anything like that. Wow. 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 Okay. 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 I was like, well, how do you, and I kept throwing, lobbing softballs back. So how do you do yours? Well, not like that. How do you do yours? And I got a little more forceful now. She's like, well, I mean, really my husband's kind of the one that, that does a lot of that stuff. Um, I mean, I help finish it, you know, like finishing the artwork. No. What do you mean? Do you, do you like do the coloring? Yeah, yeah, like the coloring and stuff like that. What what do you use for colors? I mean, I'm I'm really fascinated like that one right there. What what colors do you use? You know, like and she's like, "I don't know. You know, I it varies. Um just kind of whatever I have on hand. Like what do you use?" I have these Copic markers. I'll grab one for illustration. I was like, these Copic markers. And she's like, oh my God, yeah, I love those things. I love those things. They come in like all the colors, don't they? Well, they they come in like 200 plus colors. I, I think they're not all of What? So no, again, and I kept getting like distorted on this. I was like, what the fuck is happening here? And I kept having this weird nervous thing. Like I need to pack up all my shit every single night and not leave anything behind. And here was the weird part. I noticed that when they showed up to the show, they had very new, nice, clean, brand new looking shirts. And I couldn't figure out what was happening, but I noticed that underneath the mom's hair, cause she'd pull back her hair every once in a while into a ponytail, there was a tag sticking out the back. And her daughter was dressed up in all kinds of Nintendo shit and had a hat that the, the tag was tagged up because it was like a mesh cap on the back. So you could see the tag in there. And I'm going to come back to that later here in just a moment. So we're going back and forth on that. And then finally the guy comes back for the commission and he, had, he hadn't paid me yet. And I was like, Hey, it's ready to go. And he goes, Oh man, this, Oh my God. And he like raves about it. He's just like freaking out about it. I was very happy with that. And I wish I'd taken a photo of it. I don't think I did. And so I, you know, I did the blue line I did. And then I did some black outlining and then I colored it in pretty standard shit that I normally do. She couldn't get over it. And I just kept getting this weird energy. Like, I'm like, something is weird here. Like, I don't think they're artists. I think, I think that art's stolen. And somewhere I have the photos, and this is the thing. 
I remember when all this finally was done, I was really disgusted with how this all ended. So the next day, finally it's Sunday, and they're in a terrible mood. They didn't really sell a whole bunch. There was a few prints they sold, a few things here and there. And then I guess the daughter wanted to go and buy something, and the mom kept berating her, going, no, no, no. And, and what did you do with the tag on the hat? And so her daughter takes off the hat, and she's like, I told you not to bend the brim. I told you, leave the tag on there. Your dad is going to be so mad. And that was a weird thing to hear. Now, at the same time, I'm also talking to the, 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 the dad and his two children on this side. He's had a blast. She's not sold a lot of things. But I keep telling him, I'm like, hey, you know what? Here's my business card. If you have more questions, reach out. I would love to be able to give you guys some hints or maybe something you could try or maybe something to kind of, some other shows you could try that are smaller just to get started. But we all start out this way. You're having a great show. You're here. And that's what matters. Most people barely ever make any money the first time they do something because it just depends on what people are looking for. Thankfully, she did get a couple of commissions that day, which I was stoked to see. I did tell her, raise your price. Raise it. Raise it. But... I understand that she was a fledgling artist, but she still got like 25 bucks for a little eight by 10 sketches that she did. And it was really cool. It was like an older couple was the first one that commissioned her. They thought she was adorable. So they commissioned something in their sketchbook. And I'm like, holy shit. Cause there was like, there were some heavy hitters in that book. And then bam, this little tiny sketch. But I thought, please let her become like fucking amazing and big name and everything. Because that would be something like, well, we have a sketch from her back when she was 15. You know, that would be that would be the just the fucking chef's kiss, man. That'd be fucking badass. And, um, yeah, that'd just be fucking rad. So, anyway, they were they were pretty cool, but I could tell that they were tired. They were overwhelmed by the show, you know, three days of this shit. Coming back over here to the fucking Von Trapp family, I don't know what the fuck was going on over here. Because, Sure enough, the dad's in a foul mood. He's like, well, they're not going to fucking take it back if the, tra if the tag's on, not on it. And I'm, I'm hearing it, but I'm like, I'm not hearing you. The best I could extrapolate from everything was that they returned their clothing, their nerd outfits, as he put it, when they left the shows. That wasn't shit they kept. That's why everybody, including him, had tags on their shit still. I was like, what the hell am I seeing here? So they were really mad at their daughter for the hat thing because they couldn't return it and she had bent the brim on it. And then the guy comes over and asks me similar questions to his wife, you know, as to what I did and asked about some other ones and everything else like that. And then also went over and talked to Frank Cho and saw some of his originals laying out there. And he asked if those were originals or reproductions. And of course, Frank Cho's shit's much higher priced. So he came back, he's like, I know what we're doing wrong. We need to have prices like him. He's talking about Frank Cho. And all I could think to myself was like, no, I think you need to fess up and say that you've been like stealing people's art because I got a really good look at it. And there was distinctly some different artworks, styles that you could see. They were just smattered all around. So I took photos of it. Not of them. I took photos of that, of the shit that was laying out there because they left everything out. And then they didn't cover it. They were in such a haste to leave on Saturday night. They didn't think about it. So Saturday morning, I'm like, <laughs> I took all these fucking pictures. So I contacted, I through the email, I sent an email saying, hey, I think the people that were in Artist Alley next to me were selling unauthorized artwork. They were not the artists. They were flim flam artists on a level that should have been, it, it should have been fucking fanatical farce. It was just terrible. It was like, two shenanigans and a, and a blooper. It was fucking weird. And it, I, the worst part is that I never heard back about it. I, nobody gave a fuck. They got their money. That's all. And I've never seen that couple or that kid again. Thank God. Hopefully they just gave up on whatever they were doing. But she didn't understand why I was taking commissions or how that worked. And she's like, so you have to draw the commissions that you just, you just can't give them something you've already drawn. I was like, no, no, they're asking for me to draw in a book, these sketchbooks. Because she saw the young girl do the same thing. And they never drew. They never did anything. Any conversation I had about art supplies was just vague and odd. It was a strange circumstance. And I know I had told a few other people that were at the show. I was like, I think I'm sitting next to some fucking Russian agents or shit. I don't know what the fuck was going on. And because it was really weird, you know, like. 
I love that my, my mind, my imagination runs away with that. Like maybe, maybe I was being the nosy fucking American. Maybe I was just trying to be like, I'm going to prove that these people aren't real artists. And really, you know, they're like deep agents for like the KGB or some shit like that. And they're like, this guy next to us, he's just, he's too, uh, what's the American term? He's too nosy. Uh, we might have to bury him and his art supplies out back in dumpster, underneath the dumpster, burn him alive. Whatever, don't care. He's causing problems for us. Already had to kill all these artists to get their artwork. If he blows our cover, I, how you say, we will end up in Siberia. And that was what it fucking felt like. It was just fucking weird. And I didn't like it. And I was like, fuck. Yeah, I, I haven't told that story before. Um, so if I fucking disappear, you know where the, you know what the fuck happened. You know they found me. <laughs> no, uh, yeah, it was a weird fucking circumstance. And, and I think that that is an exact reason where if I had brought that up at any smaller show, they probably would have gone and checked. There's a lot of smaller shows that do that. They're like, we look for bootleg, we look for this, we look for that. And they don't tolerate that kind of shit. Bigger shows don't care. So... Word of the wise, if you're going to do a big show, enjoy yourself. Do what you want to do. I am not here to tell you anything. I'm here to tell you my stories. That's basically it. But this is a circumstance where I really do think that something eventually, coming back down to reality, something eventually is going to break. There are so many shows happening, so many things happening that it's no longer special. And when you start to get people that are coming to these shows that are just trying to cash in on the whole... God, I hate the term, but the whole nerd or geek aspect of it, that, because I never really considered myself either one of those things. I know there's pl plenty of people who are like, oh, geek pride, and I'm like, I, I just thought I was a kid, man, and I also thought I was an adult that just loved science fiction. I don't like the terms because I've always heard them used derisively, and in this circumstance, these were some people that, as far as I know, were very much writing the whole, hey, I'm going to play this game too and pretend to be this sort of thing. And when they tore down, that was the really interesting part was I should have gotten them out of the trash. When they tore down, they took the majority of the prints they had. But if there were any that got scuffed or anything else like that, which I guess isn't too unusual, but it was an enormous amount of them, they were throwing them out. And they... There were or there were just some things that maybe didn't sell during the show, like they and they were just throwing them away. Like there, I remember specifically they had a pack of stickers that were horses, like not even My Little Pony, like Barbie horses, and not drawn very well. But there was a bunch of them, and they didn't sell any. And I remember the father getting really upset, He's like, "No, I'm not giving that fucking box." And so I saw the box, and later like a weirdo Angela Lansbury murder she wrote kind of snoop I am. I was like, beep, 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 beep. and I looked over, I'm like, oh shit, they threw away all these stickers. Um, they threw away a whole box of them. So I don't know what was going on. It was very weird. It's very strange. Anyway, yeah. So with that, thanks for watching, guys. Once again, I appreciate it. And, uh, I will catch you guys in the next video. And I am, once again, very thankful for those of you that are watching this and enjoying the stories and stuff. If you have any questions or want to reach out or whatever, please, please do. And thank you for those of you that have started to comment and that are following. That's freaking rad as hell. I love that so much. Thank you so much. So I will catch you guys then in the next video. Come here. I know. Oh, my baby. Okay. So here's Luna again. She keeps getting this eye thing because she's got allergies. No, you can't climb on the art table. This is the one that... It's technically her heating pad, but her brother bullies her out of it. Yes, bullies you out of it. Are you going to make biscuits on me? She is literally the best little kid. I think you guys have met her before in the other videos, but her full name is Luna Love Food because that's my favorite character in Harry Potter is Larry, is Luna, Larry, Larry Lovegood. <laughs> Luna Lovegood. Right? Lovegood? Jesus, did I just get that name wrong? I bet I did. 
Holy fuck. I need to go back and reread the Harry Potter books. That's a whole other discussion too, right? Everything about J.K. Rowling. I'm not getting into that on here. I My luck, that'd be the goddamn video that would go viral and they're like, this asshole loves J.K. Rowling. No, I like the books. I didn't know she was going to go nuts. I had no idea. But you are still named Luna Love Food because you love your food. Four cans of food a day, ma'am. That's how you stay fluffy. All right, guys. I'm going to finish petting this cat for the next half hour. And I'm going to let you guys go because now I'm at 47 minutes on this video. But can you look at this? Look at this kitty. It's too much. Too much kitty. All right. I'll talk to you guys later.